Shri Sanjay Lalbhai Ji, Bimal Patel Ji, other distinguished members of the board and faculty on the dais, students and parents. I especially want to say parents because actually my guess is that they will remember this function much more than the students will. So congratulations to all the parents whose, whose wards and children are getting a degree from this very, very prestigious institution. And I'm actually also impressed that this is the 17th convocation. You know, when I was much younger, we used to be fond of this song, which said 17 going on 18. So it's quite, a, quite an important uh, event in the life of an institution to have the 17th convocation. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, you know, my wife was very impressed by SEP. She lectured here on one occasion and told me that you fellows in Delhi, you should come and listen to what younger people think about city planning. In the later years of her professional life, uh, she took to urban planning and she used to complain both to me and to the then Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, uh, that we were badly neglecting urban planning, which is true. But mind you, he always used to tell her that there's not much that he can do about urban planning because it's a state subject. I don't think she was convinced by that, and I think I'll come back to that subject a little later. But it's great to be back here. You know, I'm particularly impressed by the fact that SEPT, uh, SEPT of course is a private university, but as uh, uh, your president explained to me yesterday, it is a, a private university that was a remarkable collaboration between private industry in Ahmedabad and professionals. So, you know, whereas the traditional form of PPP is public-private partnership, this is a special form of PPP, which is private-professional partnership. And I think that's really, we need a lot more uh, of those kinds of uh, uh, participations uh, in future. So, congratulations to all, uh, including earlier generations, who had the generosity and the vision to set up this institution. And it's really nice to see how well it's developed and most of all, how very highly spoken it is. You know, if you invite an economist to speak, and even if you tell him that you've got to be a bit brief because everyone really wants to get on with the convocation and enjoy themselves, the simplest thing to do is to talk about economic growth. I mean, that's what people associate with economists. So I want to share a few thoughts with you on that subject. Now, you know, this generation which is graduating today is actually quite lucky compared to our generation. I mean, Bimal described me as coming back in 1971, nine, foregoing the pleasures of the Western world. He forgot to mention that he came back in exactly the same year as I discovered. But neither of us has regretted it. We had a lot of fun in different ways. But the difference is you are going to be, your, your next whatever 20 years are going to be years when I think if we are a bit lucky, uh, the economy will grow much faster than it did when we were your age. You know, when I was in a university, uh, the achieved growth rate of India was around three and a half percent, okay? And the population was growing at a little over two percent. So per capita income was only growing at less than 1.5 percent per year. And I think it's very important to emphasize what happens to per capita income, and especially because nowadays in the newspapers, there's far too much focus on the size of GDP. Now, whenever I meet a newspaper guy, he always says, when will we become a $5 trillion economy? 
Now, you know, the truth is, if you had two Indias exactly like each other, exactly like the India of today, and you just merged them, well, you would get twice the GDP. We would rise in the GDP rank, but we'd be just as poor. And I don't think there'd be a huge advantage in that kind of thing. So the real question is, are you expanding your GDP in a manner where per capita income is going up? And I think you will. Uh, people, nobody really knows what the growth rate will be, and it's all, it always becomes very political if you look at a very short term. But I think most people think that, you know, India could grow maybe at 7.5% over the next two decades if we do everything right. I mean, it's not a guarantee. It's not as if it's going to happen no matter what we do. <clears throat> but I think it's feasible. And you need to watch what is it that's needed to achieve that growth rate. But what does 7.5% mean for you? Well, population growth is already slowing down. Uh, over the next 20 years, in all probability, the average growth of population will only be about 0.6%. So if we grow, the GDP grows at 7.5%, and then per capita income will grow at 6.9%. Now what does that mean? Compared to our youth, when per capita income was growing at less than 1.5%. Well, what it means is that when we were younger, it would have taken 45 years for per capita income to double. And for you, it will take 10. So what this means, and you know, change in a system, whether it is change in the structure of demand, and linked to that is a change in technology, it really comes with per capita income. I mean, if you have more people at the same level of per capita income, you just have more production, but you don't have any structural change. Each one wears the same kind of clothes, each one consumes the same kind of things. But if you have people who are twice as rich, then there's structural change. The kind of clothes they wear changes, the kind of products they want to consume changes, the kind of houses they want to live in changes. And so that measure of change, which is actually what is relevant, is going to occur four times faster for this generation than it did for ours. That is actually a huge, has huge implications. Mainly because along with change in the structure of production comes change in applied technology. I'm not talking now about new technology, and that of course is happening. But you know, typically very little new technology happens for low income consumption. All the new technology happens for higher level consumption. So if people are making a change from low levels of consumption to higher levels of consumption, they're also seeing new technology. I mean, Mr. Patel mentioned uh, computers. I think Mr. Lalbai also mentioned we must have more online access. All of this is a function of per capita income. And as this spread of per capita income deepens, many, many more of our population will be in that position and then that will impact everybody else because you'll see a change in technology taking place. Now, what is that? To, let me add to that uh, what, what you will see as architects and city planners and so on in the area of urbanization. You know, India has traditionally been viewed as being slow to urbanize, but that pace of urbanization is now accelerating. It's accelerating because income is rising, people are moving to urban areas because there's more to do, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and the rough numbers are quite staggering because, you know, uh, as of 2020, India's urban population was 480 million or something like that. And by 2050, when all of you will be at a mature stage of your architect profession and therefore have done quite a lot of things, that population may well be 700 million. So we are going to end up adding 
almost the same amount of population in urban areas that exists today. Especially if you consider that the 480 million out of them, almost 200 million are hopelessly inadequately housed. So the new housing, including the quality of housing that has to be created, is probably larger than anywhere else in the world. I mean, if you judge an architect's uh, market by how much change is occurring in the urban space, the market in India should be much larger than in developed countries because they are experiencing a decline in population. They don't actually need more housing. They'll, of course, retool their housing, redesign it, this, that, and the other. But the basic urban infrastructure for the populations they have is already there, and that's good. In our case, it's not, and therefore, we probably need to graduate many more architects and town planners than SEPT will ever be able to produce in the short run. Of course, on the other side, we have to be able to use them. And I think that's perhaps one of the biggest challenges because honestly, and this comes back to what I said earlier, you know, city planning is going to become very crucial because we can't go down the building the metropolitan city route. I mean, if you look at the numbers, the density of cities like Delhi and Mumbai and Bangalore is much higher now than in most cities in the West. And the idea that all these new urban uh, people are going to move into the existing metropolises is quite wrong. So we really need uh, the next layer of cities in India to expand hugely. And of course, one of the things that uh, new technology does is it allows people to disperse offices so they can be pretty seamlessly connected, even if you're not sitting uh, in Nariman Point. Uh, and that will mean that we need to look to a much greater expansion of second, not second tier, but in fact, non-metropolitan plus second tier cities in India, which is entirely in the hands of state governments. I mean, the central government can help by providing some money, but the, the impetus has to come from state governments. You know, I have often felt that uh, one of our problems is that the only time that people are willing to think big about a city is when a new state capital has to be created. When a new state is created, it becomes sort of a sub-national interest that we must have a terrific capital. So the kind of objections that normally get raised whenever you do any urban development uh, are not raised. So maybe the solution lies in actually having more states. I mean, many of our states are now quite honestly becoming big enough. The size of UP, for example, is probably larger than all except a handful of countries in the United Nations. And there have been efforts made by people to say that, look, uh, we, could, we could break up some of our biggest states into smaller states. And there are lots of pros and cons of doing that. But you know, one of the biggest pros, quite honestly, is that if we had another five or six states, we would be planning another five or six state capitals. And that would be a terrific boost to city planning and rational planning and looking at the whole thing ab initio in a way in which it would be a bit of a dream for city planners. So something like this would be, in my view, part of the structural change that one can hope for, though I don't know how one does that politically. But having said that, um, it is very important that state governments begin to realize that it's not possible to project an image of a state that is ready uh, to invite investments and provide an attractive environment for investments, attract younger professionals, attract the kind of high-skilled professionals that a future economy will need, unless it's providing a, a livable city. 
And quite honestly, that is something I hope, I know many of you will become architects. I hope some of you will also become city planners. And I hope that the structure will move in a way that uh, uh, whoever decides these things uh, regards, regards real rethinking uh, uh, on what a, a modern Indian city should be like as high on the agenda, not just replicate what we've done before. And the last point that I want to make is that, you know, all this is going to be very powerfully affected by climate change, which we know is underway. And we also know that everybody thinks we should control it, and let's hope that some of the uh, targets being set will be met. But the current assessment is that the target of 1.5, limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial level will not be met. Uh, most likely we will, the best we can do is to have two degrees, could be even a little bit more. Now, you know, that has tremendous implications for a country like India. And if you're going to have people moving into cities, rising income levels, the demand for cooling is going to expand hugely. So the whole issue of how buildings are designed uh, to take account of the fact that ambient temperatures are going to be much more uncomfortable than they've been in the past has to be built into people's consciousness. I mean, people who get houses built have to be aware that if they don't do this, they will be saddled with impossibly expensive efforts to cool the environment. And uh, frankly, uh, uh, architects are best positioned to um, convey to people what is possible. Uh, and I think on the other hand, city planners and regulators uh, are well positioned also to design regulations that force people to do these things. So these are the, some of the changes that are occurring, some internal because of faster growth, some external because of climate change. Uh, all said and done, it's going to be a very exciting life for those of you that are designing buildings and helping governments to plan cities. So I wish you the very best, enjoy yourselves, and have a productive working life. And thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you.